Hello, my name is Kaija Kaitavuori, and I am an art historian, a sociologist as to my background. And um, I have worked as a museum educator and writer and editor, researcher and uh, teacher. And uh, here today I am talking about mediating. This is the title. It's all mediating and I'm going to talk about art institutions as contact zones or conflict zones. And I hope that will become more obvious as we go on what it means. And here are some of the topics that I hope to cover. So first I will say something general about the concept of mediation and how I see it. Then relate that to art institutions and their audiences in particular. And then maybe going into uh, deeper with uh, the ideas of uh, our practicalities of uh, audience engagement and structures of participation. And then at the end, uh, say something about mediation as, as a profession. <clears throat> and the first image that I've chosen here is uh, about 100 years ago in Ateneum, which is part of the Finnish National Gallery, where I have worked previously. And this is supposed to show as kind of a <laughs> common uh, idea of an uh, event or um, a moment of mediation, although maybe a bit different than what it looks like today, but there is a group of people visiting an art exhibition, looking at art and someone talking about uh, that art. We should maybe focus on this guy standing here between the group and art uh, as the, some kind of a token mediator or the imper impersonated uh, mediator uh, person uh, standing in the middle uh, in between the uh, audience and art helping and bridging and enabling the encounter but maybe also on the other hand uh, standing on the way perhaps uh, anyway being in, this is the idea of being between in the middle and I put there on the left side the uh, Latin origin of this word uh, to mediate it is about something that is placed in the middle and in, in between um, things. So this is what, what we are going to, to focus. And to locate the, the discussion, I'm using this kind of a, a production chain model that comes from uh, production of goods um, and economy, perhaps. Uh, but it is sort of common idea that we have about how art becomes public and how it reaches its audiences. And the idea consists of there being an artist who produces the work and then something happens, somebody takes hold of that art object and brings it to the audience who is the receiver at the receiver end of the chain. And as you see, it kind of follows the, um, the production idea of, of consumer goods. There's a producer, they the, uh, make the product, then there's the distribution phase and then the consumer <clears throat> gets uh, the, the product. Um, but there's uh, uh, something maybe a little bit uh, simplistic about this chain. It, it only, there's only one way flow in it. And I think today we would like to think about this uh, process in a bit more uh, varied and compl complex ways. Um, but before going into that, I'd like to point out that when we talk about mediation here or mediators, it is a wider concept than just uh, art mediators in terms of art educators. And the, going back to the historical reference from the previous slide, uh, here the mediator is actually somebody who we would today call a curator, someone who takes care of the art collection. So the, the roles of curators and mediators have not always been separated, but they've been part of the sort of same job description and, and the curators or the caretakers of the collections have also been the public facing uh, side of, of the institution. And here, for example, receiving a group of visitors and, and, and talking to them. So this mediation layer is, is very uh, wide and complex and includes many things. And what we're going to focus on today is this audience facing side of this mediation layer. But just to point out that there are um, many other things included in that, and it has been in constant change and uh, kind of had gone through a process of specialization. So today we have different pro professions that work in this mediation layer. I've already mentioned curators and educators as separate professions. And it has, as I said, it has always not been like that, but there's been many changes going on in that field. Instead of thinking that we have already artwork, 
and then it just needs uh, a channel of, of distributors or dealers to, in order to reach the audience. I think we would like to get a more complex idea of, of the process. And I've here taken a different um, chart or graphic from Axel Bronz, who uh, has coined this um, concept of producer, which is a uh, combination of producer uh, and user. So if you see, it's written with S in the middle. So it is actually something that he would like to uh, promote as, as a complex way of at the same time using and producing things. And this is something that is quite common in online um, production and game industry, for example, but I kind of like to take it up here in, in the art context because it kind of twists the linear line and makes it round, makes it into a loop and puts the producer and the consumer or the art production and art consumption or art enjoyment closer to each other and actually shows that there are many context, contacts and connections between those. They are not the opposite ends of uh, this value chain or production chain, but it actually, they, they are connected uh, in many ways. So this is the idea that I'd, I'd like to promote when talking about uh, mediation, that it includes many other um, actors, not just uh, curators or educators, but many, and also uh, that it is not linear, but there is the, the flow goes also to the, goes, goes both ways. And we're gonna talk about that more uh, in a minute. Uh, but there is another way of putting it, which I found quite amusing and, but also informative. So here is a, a cartoon uh, which says that my four-year-old could have conceived this artwork, overseen a team of assistants to produce it, insert it in the critical discourse of the period, and make it become a critical piece of the canonical narrative of modernism. So this is, of course, uh, a joke about um, what we hear a lot about contemporary art, People said, oh, that's so easy to make. My four-year-old four could have done that art artwork because it doesn't take that much technical skill. But this uh, art tune by Pablo Helguera, who is an artist, an educator himself, points out that there's much more uh, to the process. And, and, and he's particularly pointing to the mediator layer uh, between the artist and, and the audience. That there, there are a lot of other things that happen in that mediation layer before it becomes art. And so that there's, there are many agents and many contributors uh, in that process to make art happen and make art public. And educators are part of that, but there are, there are many others. And I think I still have one more uh, way of saying more or less the uh, same thing. And this is a, a quote from Howard Becker, again, a quite uh, old source from the seventies. And he's talking about music and uh, symphony orchestras and uh, explaining what it takes to produce a concert. And he says that to produce a concert, for instance, instruments must have been invented, manufactured and maintained. A notation must have been devised and music composed using that notation. People must have learned to play the noted notes on the instruments. Times and places for rehearsal must have been provided. Ads for the concert must have been placed, publicity arranged and tickets sold and an audience capable of listening to and in some way understanding and responding to the performance must have been recruited. So this is in a very concise space, has a lot of information about what happens, what is the infrastructure that enables art to happen and that it's not only something that happens in the background, but it's actually something very actual happening all the time when art is produced and used and enjoyed. And he particularly, uh, in difference to many other art world theoricians, uh, he puts a lot of waste, weight on, on the audience and I've sort of highlighted here it here with different color that it's uh, uh, according to him, he's a sociologist or was a sociologist, uh, it's, uh, the audience is also important in terms of creating and enabling art. So this is the, the sort of putting into frame the uh, idea and field of mediation. And I, now I would like to move to uh, the art institutions and I'm using Art Museum as uh, the tool to talk about this, but because of my background and my examples come from the Art Museum, but uh, to the, most of the time, this could be applied to other kinds of uh, museums as well as other art institutions. So just imagine um, that we are talking about other organizations that we are maybe more uh, familiar with. But I'm going to do it with this um, very simple museum chart, 
uh, which here uh, highlights two of the basic functions of a museum. On, one, on the one hand, it's a heritage institution, and on the other, it's a cultural institution. And I'll just explain what I mean by this. Um, as a heritage institution, the museum can be compared with uh, other collections and archives. So it's something that collects and preserves uh, things, for example, art, if we talk about art museums. And it needs specialized, specialist people to take care of these functions. And they are called, for example, curators and assistants and researchers and conservators and archivists and people who are specialized in maintaining and preserving things. And if this was the only function of the museum, the only people that it serves is actually research, researchers, because this is, these are things that happen behind the scenes. But therefore, it has this other side, which is the, the uh, open side of the institution. It also mediates, that is, it exhibits, it shows, it produces things and uh, puts them on show. And for this function, it needs another set of specialized people, such as curators and producers. It also needs people who communicate about the content, who build the um, physical setting for putting things up. And it needs the people who, who receive the visitors, guards and front of house staff. And here we usually talk about audiences and viewers and visitors as people who, who benefit from uh, these functions. And these are the two sides that are usually mentioned when we kind of try to define what the museum is, but it's not enough. Uh, we've become accustomed to talking about museums as learning environments as well. Uh, and uh, so here we compare museums to learning institutions, educational institutions. And again, we need another set of people who work there for this function. And now we come to educators or mediators uh, who particularly focus on the idea of people coming to the museum or exhibition to learn something. And we also, in the English parlance, at least talk about learners. Not sure about other languages. In Finnish, we don't use this word, at least not outside the professional circles, circles of, of educators. But these are kind of the different layers of the same institution. And apart from the collection side, it, this, uh, these other functions can be compared to any other cultural institutions. They show things, they are public places, and they, they also focus on uh, learning. But the last column um, about the visitors or users of this collection, that it, when we talk about learners, we kind of widen it up a little bit from the idea of just visitor who just comes and looks in the learner notion, we already think about uh, that the, the um, learner has an ag uh, active agenda, wants to take something away from um, the exhibition or the museum and comes there for a purpose that they want to do. And indeed, these uh, functions are part of a, the museum definition by ICOM, International Council of Museums. And this definition is from 2007, and it uh, highlights these particular things. Uh, a museum is a non-profit permanent institution in the service of society and its development open to the public, which acquires, conserves and researches, the first function, communicates and exhi exhibits, the second function, the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purposes of education, study and enjoyment. So these are the three functions mentioned in the um, official definition of museum. But what has happened is that this is not enough anymore for some time. Uh, it's been felt that museums are more than that, or they should be more than that. And I've added here um, one more line in the chart, and it's the museum as a public space. So here we are thinking about the museum or an exhibition or another art organization as a forum where people come to. And uh, we start to think about the people who come to the exhibition or museum uh, slightly differently. If we think that this is a place for a gathering for uh, anyone to come and use it. And indeed, we, we can ta start talking about users of the resources that the institution offers uh, for its publics. Or we can talk about citizens as uh, some uh, people who are active and come together to do things together, to talk together, to act together. Or participants, if we want to underline the, that the people who come, they don't only come to take something away, but they actually bring something back or bring uh, issues of discussion or some material things or questions or challenges um, to the organizing institution. So here we come back to the idea that there's more of a circle between the production and the, and the usage of the cultural 
offer and that it's linked and that the flow goes to both directions, not only from the specialist organization to the lay audiences, but that there is more, more traffic in, in that channel, if you like. And this indeed has been felt also by ICOM. Uh, and you may know that the uh, museum definition is uh, uh, under revision and it's, a, it's been a long process. And two years ago in 2019, the uh, council got together in a big meeting uh, and trying to uh, give out a new definition. And this is what was proposed then. And uh, this is quite different from the previous definition. So here it says that Museums are democratizing inclusive and polyphonic spaces for critical dialogue about the past and the futures. Acknowledging and addressing the conflicts and challenges of the present, they hold artifacts and specimens in trust for society, safeguard diverse memories for future generations and guarantee equal rights and equal access to heritage for all people. And in the next paragraph, they mention participatory and transparent and diverse communities uh, uh, human dignity and social justice and e equality and things that did not really come up in the earlier definition or the sort of restricted functions of the museum. So there's clearly a change that is felt um, in thinking about what cultural institutions are for and, and whom they are, are serving. But it's maybe telling that this uh, proposal was not accepted in the ICOM uh, committee meeting or general meeting, um, and it's still, uh, I think, uh, in process. What what will happen and how this will be processed more? But this felt uh, too maybe too new or too uh, far from the traditional definition of museums that it wasn't re readily accepted. For me, it's just interesting to see that these ideas about the public space uh, kind of come up in also this museum um, definition discussion. Um, yeah, so uh, one more way of kind of compiling or summarizing these different um, functions of a museum is a quote that I'm again going to read. So this, this quote asks about what is the function of an art museum and it says, in former years this was usually answered by saying that it should preserve and care for the permanent collections entrusted to its keeping, so function number one. It should publish the catalogues of the same and keep the galleries open under more or less severe restrictions to the public. So the second function, openness and ex exhibiting. And, and the writer says uh, more, but this is not enough. Uh, the art museum of today, if it properly fulfills its function, is no longer a mere storehouse, which would be just to have a collection. It must offer to the public changing exhibitions of contemporaneous art. It should be the center of artistic activities of the community in which it exists. The most successful art museum of today is at once a storehouse, a college, the educational side, and the general exchange for the art of the whole community. So here again is the uh, idea of art institution as a, as a forum um, and as a, as a public space. And now I usually ask people to guess when uh, this uh, statement was uh, published. And I don't know if the listeners already know or if you want to give a wild guess uh, when this this quote dates back to? I would guess that it's kind of beginning of 20th century. Beginning of 20th century, that's really good. <laughs> Usually people say that it's maybe from the 70s, but you are actually right. Yeah, quite often people find it surprising that, that uh, these same questions have been asked and uh, debated over already 100 years. And I mean, we are kind of still in the same, there's some, some progress, but these ideas have come up earlier. And this is a, a museum director from Chicago, art museum in Chicago, who, who has said this, but it's, it, I was quite struck when I found it, this, that it actually summarizes a lot of the, the uh, same issues and, and functions that we are looking at at the moment about cultural institutions. But yeah, then as, as, a, as professionals or mediators, this is what we are looking at. We are looking at the last column here, or maybe not the researchers, but the three below uh, boxes from audiences to participants. And this is what we are working with and thinking about how to uh, uh, facilitate these, these uh, contacts and what we can do uh, in these different fields. And, and slightly different questions come up, uh, uh, whether we regard 
the art museum as a cultural institution or a learning environment or, or a public space. Uh, just to give an example, usually on the uh, level of thinking about visitors, we, we then talk about, for example, access questions. How do the visitors actually get to uh, the venue? How do they receive information? And we're trying to think of different differences in the ways in which people move and, and, and um, receive uh, information and, and messages. And then when we start thinking about the visitors as learners, we uh, start asking uh, ourselves different questions about the ways in which people learn things. So we'll, we'll talk about, for example, learning styles and methods to uh, help people uh, encounter and learn and, and encounter the art from that point of view. And then if we if we start thinking about the museum as a public space, uh, then we again start asking different questions about who actually comes there, who feels comfortable coming, what kind of rules and opportunities the, the museum or the venue or the organization imposes on its users and, and visitors. And we again start to look at the encounters from a slightly, slightly different uh, terms. So the, um, the mediation, uh, can mean many things and it can address many issues uh, in one ways helping people, but in other ways also uh, maybe criti being critical and asking, asking difficult questions. So next uh, I'll go into the uh, sort of more concrete ways of, of dealing with uh, this circle or this oval at the end, like how, how do we do that? But before actually going there, there are some um, words about terminology. Um, so, uh, we, we are talking about mediation, but it's kind of a new concept. Maybe uh, in English speaking countries, uh, the terms that have been used traditionally are museum education and more recently learning. Many of the educational departments in museums changed their uh, names into learning some time ago. Uh, the idea being of uh, moving away from this kind of didactic idea of education and opening it up to a more uh, learner centered, learner led way of approach. In Finland, we have used the word pedagogy uh, as, as, as a uh, term to talk about museum educators, but that has changed as well. Now we've kind of opted more towards the audience uh, development or audience engagement, uh, which is the last uh, bullet point in this list. But there are other ways that the, the German and Scandinavian languages use something that is very uh, similar to mediation, this Vermittlung or Vermittling, this is some, this kind of middleman intermediary uh, person or function. Um, in French, this uh, cultural service, this has been quite popular. Interpretation is also one term that is used. And as I said, then the idea of audience engagement or audience development, um, the audience development can have two different meanings. Uh, one is the quantitative meaning, like developing the numbers of audiences, um, attracting more people, in which sense it goes very close to marketing. But it can also mean um, uh, reaching out to new audi audiences, so audience development in terms of widening the, the audience base. But here, I, I personally really like the, the word mediation. But I think the reason why it hasn't been the main term in English is that it has two, it has a double meaning in English. And the one that we connect with education is this first one is to connect uh, things. So uh, the educator as mediator is somebody who puts things together, who bridges things, uh, makes the encounter with art uh, possible and, uh, and pleasurable and enjoyable. <clears throat> but it also has another meaning. Uh, it's kind of a legal term where somebody works as a mediator in a quarrel or a dispute and tries to bring the two parties into agreement. And this is something that has not been readily uh, understood as part of the museum work, but I personally kind of like both of these. And I think this second meaning uh, brings forth the idea that things are not so smooth and easy and democratic as we would like to think they are, but there are many, there are also conflicts and, and uh, uh, problems or frictions in this encounter between people and art institutions and art and therefore it's actually a good idea to keep them in mind and these two different meanings can mean can be linked to the uh, different idea of museum the first one um, to the museum as a context zone and uh, which comes from anthropology uh, and then the second one could be defined as museum museum as a conflict zone and we'll uh, see a little bit more what that could mean <clears throat> uh, just later but then what are the different ways in which we can somehow intervene in the 
encounter between uh, visitors or uh, viewers and art. And this is a very simple, very, very simple craft uh, by um, uh, a graphic by uh, two researchers, John Falk and Lynn Dierking, um, the museum experience, in which they highlight the fact that the, the experience of content, art, maybe in this instance, is also dependent on the on the context of the visit and they divide it in three parts there's the physical social and personal part and the physical is quite self-explanatory the physical refers to the building and the, the material uh, environment that the visitor encounters in the uh, <clears throat> in the museum materials lights uh, is it are they are people able to move around are there seats uh, to uh, have a little rest in the middle of the visit and things like that. And we know from research that these aspects are very important um, in terms of the experience. They stay in people's mind uh, a lot and they sort of color the uh, experience of the vis visit much more than we would maybe spontaneously think. Uh, then the social aspect of the visit are all the human contacts that happen during the visit, the people that the visitors bring with them. So it has an effect on the visit, whether they come with their family, with their friends, with school or alone, and also the context that they, they make in the museum and with the staff or other visitors. So this is another um, aspect of the context. And then they also bring their own personal context, which includes all the experiences and expectations, maybe prejudices about what they are going to see. And, and Falk and Deer King uh, themselves divide this into three in cognitive, social and experimental. Uh, motifs of, of the visit. So connected to the idea of knowledge and information uh, of a social situation and, and looking for experiences. So now the question is, how can we as, as mediators affect these different uh, contexts so that uh, we can enable a, a, a good visit or a good encounter? The, the physical uh, has some limits. It depends on where we work, what the building is like, but of course uh, we can uh, ask feedback from uh, the audience and, and try to react to that. But I will focus now more on the sort of human aspect of, of the visit, so the social and the personal um, contexts of, of, of the visit and what happens there. Uh, there are different ways of trying to kind of understand what uh, people do when they visit and visitor uh, research is very important for uh, understanding our visitors, but I'm not going to talk about the different ways of doing that right now, but these are just some outcomes that uh, various uh, researchers have found out. Um, I, I'm using these visiting styles quite often because it's, it's kind of a um, very concrete and also a little bit funny way of understanding that not everybody follows what we intend to uh, deliver when designing an exhibition. Uh, except for this ant, which is the visitor who is interested in everything and will follow the path that is, is made when the exhibition is planned and will, it's kind of a studious uh, um, pupil who, who uh, will do what is expected and guide it and go through the exhibition bit by bit. But a lot of people do not do that. Uh, what these researchers define as fish is someone who comes and wants to walk through the whole exhibition first to see what's there and then make uh, a decision what to do. Uh, and a butterfly is uh, someone who is, is flying from object to uh, object and doesn't uh, really uh, pay attention to what the curators would want to, to deliver or would want how they would like to guide the visitors, but just makes their own mind um, and follows that. And a grasshopper is a very uh, sort of picky visitor who only has a, a very special interest and only looks at things that serve the purpose of this visit or their interests. So these are all different ways of using the offer that, that the museum uh, gives. Part of the, the are also the, um, the level of expertise, whether people are already experts and professionals, whether they come there as students, whether they are visiting with uh, their friends or whether they are just occasional visitors in a new place as tourists and, and so on. And the same goes with the type of interest that they come with. People may have very specific agendas why they want to visit an exhibition. And uh, same goes to learning styles, as I already mentioned. I'm not going to go into the different learning styles. It's a kind of a lecture apart. Uh, and there's actually quite a lot of information available if you want to study that. But as an, as an educator or mediator, these are the different interests that we might want to address and, and uh, uh, help with or uh, produce something, some tools uh, to meet with these different 
interests. Uh, and then I have a couple of ways of uh, sort of organizing the ideas of different types of um, activities and uh, materials or events. And this is Charles Lee Peters' uh, four uh, model, uh, four point model about just any kind of activities that uh, are organized in society. And he divides it with uh, four different prepositions to, for, with, and by. And the, um, they correspond to different kind of ideas uh, of uh, how and what is is produced as 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 an activity or material, and the two um, way of working is is this instructive and didactive um, way of uh, providing authoritarian um, commands or even coercion, trying to make people do things as we want them to do. Whereas four is something that is provided for people, it's doing something on behalf of people and, and providing it for them, so it's a service. And the with would refer to uh, projects and activities that are uh, designed collaboratively with others, so it's not made for them, but it's made with them and based on dialogue. And by is something that is kind of independently made or initiated by people uh, and, and is based on this um, self-motivation. An, an, an activity, uh, independent activity. So we might uh, think of this in different fields, like for example, in school, what it would mean, or in hospitals, if uh, um, doctoral appointments were uh, built depending on these different activities. But of course, we are interested in what it means in terms of education or a mediation in, in art. Uh, and there can be many examples. I've just here collected three different images of uh, a guided tour, so a very standard way of Sort of art mediation and we we repeat here the first picture which uh, to my mind has an element of this control which is connected with the uh, authoritarian idea of two things are done to you almost without you you asking so in the early days these uh, visits to museums and exhibitions have been um, also part of this kind of education in terms of behavior uh, uh, and there is an element of control uh, in that. Whereas in the second one, this is also a guided tour, but as we can see, much more relaxed um, way of doing it and, and relaxed setting. So this could be either in the um, idea of four, so somebody is doing this visit for someone as a service, but depending on what actually is happening between the people, it could also be with, it could be based on dialogue and looking together at art and making interpretation together. Uh, and kind of move in the scale. The last picture uh, is a picture of two guides who do not do any tours, so they are not doing it for you or for anyone, but they are just in the uh, museum space as discussion guides or ask me guides, they are known by different names, who people can engage with if they think they, they want to have a discussion or have questions. So this would definitely be with uh, kind of activity. And then if we think what would be by activities or something that is initiated not by the museum but by visitors themselves, uh, this would be an interesting thing maybe then uh, actually providing um, opportunities for people to start a discussion on a topic that they want to. So this discussion kind of could serve to that but if, it, if we would want to make it public it would be a different kind of um, activity in the museum maybe. So uh, Someone who has talked about or thought about these activities in museum context is Nina Simon, and her concept of participatory museum is very well known. Uh, and she has divided uh, the levels of these uh, activities in, in four steps, uh, which are here contribution, collaboration, co creation, and hosting. Uh, and they start from this uh, invitation for contribution, meaning that the, the, the visitors are asked to. Uh, maybe comment on something or bring a little uh, uh, contribution to some uh, project, but it's it's initiated and, and controlled by the, the institution. Uh, whereas the collaborate, collaborative projects uh, invites visits, visitors or audiences to be participants. Um, in, in projects, they are still initiated with by artists or institutions, but the, the uh, participants have more active role in it and co-creative projects then would be projects that are started together they are designed also together with uh, the participants they can it can be based on open call or uh, more uh, closed idea of, of community or group of people who 
to work uh, in the project in order to create something. And hosting would be the most open form where the initiative comes from the outside of the institution and the institution provides the space, the resources and hosts an activity that is uh, designed and made and initiated by someone else and not the uh, organization. So these would be the uh, different levels of of these uh, different approaches in museum. Oh, and the picture I forgot to say is from a, a project in Kiasma in which uh, children from a preschool and a daycare center worked for two semesters, getting to know the museum and uh, the different uh, staff and people who work there and preparing for this special event in connection to a big international exhibition where the, the children chose the artworks that they wanted to talk about and they were the guides in the museum for the visitors and also they devised uh, workshop activities uh, and, and uh, uh, functioned as workshop leaders in, in that event. And there's another image here uh, where one of the uh, special ways of looking at art is presented here. You, you could be lying on a flying carpet and talk with your, your, your special guide about artworks and see them from a slightly different angle uh, this time. And these levels of participation here are the way that I have uh, kind of imagined the, the ways in which we can think about participation in, in institutions. And I'm starting with the participation as a member of audience, by which I kind of want to say that, that being just the visitor without any further activity is also participation. It's participating in the culture, just coming and being part, and it's not passive in that sense. But there are other ways of, of being more active participant. One of, one of them is um, participating in the making of art. So these would be artist-led projects in which they invite people to do something or make something. But in the institution, I think the last two one are more interesting uh, and how to, how to achieve that are the sort of challenging questions. So participating in the interpretation of art and the example of the children's project here would be one of those so that the, uh, the museum or the art institution does not withhold the right of talking about the art that is exhibited to themselves. So in, instead of or aside of um, professional or staff initiated interpretations, uh, the uh, institution also allows and gives visibility to interpretations made by other people, such as here, the children. And the last one would be then participating in the functioning of the institution itself. Uh, like, for example, making decisions about acquisitions or curating or communication or ways in which the museum functions. And this is obviously the most challenging way of integrating people, but there, uh, it is being done in many places. And one way of doing that uh, are the different kind of panels in which people uh, take part. And I have later on one example of this kind of public curation, for example. Yes, the last last one of these models of thinking about uh, mediation is Carmen Mörsch's four uh, points. They all seem to be going fours. I don't know if there's a, a magical uh, number magic going there, but also she has four different approaches in uh, mediation or education, and they are affirmative, reproductive, deconstructive, and transformative. And what they mean uh, is uh, the first one is about uh, activities that intend to maintain what is already there and it's mostly directed to public that uh, knows the uh, museum or the venue and and uh, is familiar with art that is shown there and so it's all it's about information uh, and materials that is pro uh, produced for this sort of more or less um, familiar audiences uh, and it's usually done by the museum uh, curators or stuff and it's not, not always or not quite often not considered as education but it's part of the sort of uh, curatorial part of mediation uh, and uh, the reproductive is then maybe more the, the sort of standard field of working of educators for educators and the intention is to create new audiences for uh, art and also kind of secure that they will be more visitors and viewers in the future. So this would include typically uh, school programs uh, and, and these this kind of activities that are devised by educators, people who are recognized as, as museum educators. So uh, to create uh, more understanding to the, the content of the museum or the uh, organization. Deconstructive is a bit more challenging 
again, and this would be the approach that uh, takes a critical stance to the two previous approaches by asking questions such as who decided what is on show, uh, who decides what we are supposed to think about it, and can we somehow also take part and ask questions about the canonized ideas of of art and show the um, structures and the history behind it and how, how these collections or museums and notions of art have been have been structured. And the transformative uh, approach would take an even more kind of activist um, uh, starting point in, in which the, the museum or the art organization is asked to kind of go beyond its um, traditional and physical limits and take part actively in the society. So it should not stay within its own uh, con uh, walls and only talk about art in a very comfortable and secure situation, but actually venture out and see how it can serve the society in a more um, active way. So the first two would be this sort of um, traditional ways of uh, approaches where there is someone who knows and is a teacher, and the other one is the learner. Uh, and the two latter ones are based more on self-criticism and this kind of uh, awareness of education being not only uh, emancipatory, but educa that education can also be restrictive um, uh, and, and kind of working against that and asking questions about uh, that approach. Uh, and what Carmen is saying is not that this would be kind of um, uh, that one that the later ones would or the further ones would completely uh, demolish the previous ones, but mainly that or more that the, these can exist side by side and be connected to different kind of um, activities. I've listed here on the right uh, certain activities. They don't necessarily correspond only to the um, kind of the, the one approach, but they are more easily uh, kind of lend themselves to certain approaches. So the idea of, of providing information through lectures and films and guided tours and catalogues easily connects with the affirmative uh, approach, but depending on how they are made, they can also be, uh, for example, deconstructive. Workshops and the school programs and family programs and th thoughts about access naturally, more naturally maybe con connect with the reproductive function, but again, depending on what kind of dialogues are initiated in these, they could also be deconstructive or why not even transformative. And then the small venturous uh, activities like interventions and independent programs uh, and uh, opening up the participative uh, approach for others than the, the museum staff would then connect uh, more firmly with the deconstructive or, or a transformative uh, approach. So just a reminder is that, that the museum institutions are themselves part of the, the social structure. So these conflict situations do not come uh, to surface if the, the museums only cater for those who are already comfortable uh, in coming. But these more kind of mediator, mediating instances may become uh, necessary in the secondary meaning when, when uh, we start moving out from the, the uh, very secure confinements of the museums and, and in being in dialogue with the, the world outside. So, okay, so here are some of the um, projects that have been uh, uh, done in Kiasma when I was working there, and it's part of the Finnish National Gallery, if I didn't mention, and I have not been working there for a while, so these examples are not most recent, but I'm sure the listeners can, can connect with something more recent from your own uh, uh, professional life and experience. But this was one, this was one of the first uh, programs that we did that aimed at uh, um, widening up the interpretation, uh, participation in interpretation to other people than the, the professionals inside uh, the museum. So this was connected to uh, the exhibition by Olli Lutikainen, a Finnish artist, and there are two images uh, of his art. And what we did was we invited uh, young children, teenagers, and also adults, if they wanted to, uh, to tell stories about um, these uh, artworks. And story crafting is a special technique that has been devised for uh, children and um, uh, adults and in the communication between children and adults. And it's not about telling stories to children, but on the other way, listening to stories that the children uh, are telling and writing them down, making them uh, permanent in, in the way of, of writing down the, their stories. And what we did here in uh, the exhibition, we also published them 
uh, in different ways. So they could be read by other visitors, uh, printed or um, on computers that were located uh, in, in the exhibition space. So the, I'm not going to go in the detail like what came out from the, that process and what the stories were like. They were very wonderful stories. But the main point is that we did not want to say, tell the children what the works are about uh, or kind of give an interpretation, but we asked them what do you think these are about? What do you see in these uh, in these images? And then these responses were shared to other visitors. They were not kind of you know kept uh, in in the, the family or in the in the uh, daycare group that came. But the idea was that there there would be more voices visible and heard in the exhibition space. So that was just one way of trying to open up their in, uh, participation in interpreting the, the content. Uh, and then uh, here's another approach of kind of different uh, examples of, of um, approaches in which, in a similar way, the interpretation or guiding or talking has been opened up to uh, non-professionals or non-specialists and uh, kind of acknowledging that there are many kinds of specialisms in the audiences that you don't necessarily need to have a PhD in art history or uh, philosophy, but you can talk about art in an informed way from different perspectives. And Castle Documenta in 2007 experimented with this. Uh, I think it was the first time then there uh, as part of this kind of doc, um, biennial uh, ed education using local experts as uh, guides uh, and, and part, kind of creating the, the uh, program. Here are some two images from that. And we have also experimented with this PLA programming uh, uh, in, in Kiasma and we took the idea from uh, and worked in collaboration with uh, Tate Galleries in England where they have for maybe 20 years now worked with this Young Tate uh, program in which young people use the museum as a resource and initiate program that uh, is interesting to them and share that with their, their peer group. So this goes really close to the idea of, of museum hosting somebody else and uh, the uh, people being the initiators and the creators of the program. And what the, the institution does is just to provide the, the resources, the collections or the space, also budget. Both these groups uh, had their own budget to do things with and uh, expertise that exists in, in the house. And then it's up to the, uh, the young people to create the content uh, that they want. And uh, a last example of this kind of uh, working with uh, audiences and giving authority and agency to audiences was this exhibition in um, a neighborhood in Helsinki. Um, there's a special reason why this neighborhood was chosen. This it was connected to the origin of, of Kiasma building uh, at the time when it was built. But the main point here is that uh, the people in this uh, uh, neighborhood uh, collected a group of people, or, or it was based on an open call who then got to know uh, Kiasma's collections and contemporary art and different uh, activities that uh, are connected to the collections in a similar way, basically, than the, the daycare and preschool groups did. So these are always long processes. And then based on that, and with the help of uh, Kiasma staff and experts, they created their own exhibition in their own neighborhood in five different uh, locations. Uh, they, so they chose uh, the, the themes, they chose the artworks, they invited the people to uh, for a, a talks program, they organized the opening and produced uh, the publication and everything that went around that. So uh, that was uh, uh, one example of this idea of giving, uh, opening up the agency of, uh, um, of participation and, and activity out from the museum. So just very quickly, um, uh, that like, what is it that, uh, in, according to my uh, experience, what is it that that educators or mediators uh, who work with audiences, what do they do? I think it consists of three different approaches. One is of uh, giving information. So here I'm referring to the sort of uh, low level approaches of uh, that we've seen, like maybe it could be connected to affirmative uh, approach in, in um, Carmen Mercy's terms or 
contribution uh, in, in si Nina Simon's terms, but it is, I think it is important to acknowledge that there is a lot of specialist information around art and it should not be kept secret. So it's also important to have these ways of working where this information is uh, made available. So text, talks, tours, something like that. But it's also, um, and then there are different questions of how to do that. And I've, I've kind of added it there. And there are of course also many problems maybe like what is the right way to do it and how it should be done. But the other approach is this uh, encouragement to approach art without too much uh, knowledge beforehand and actually respecting the knowledge that we all have uh, and connecting art with what is already familiar with the audiences. And this can be connected to, uh, for example, more sort of active ways of approaching and can be connected to hands-on uh, or dialogical uh, um, workshops or, or, or events. And the third very important aspect is also raise questions about the infrastructure and the, um, the, uh, the, the canon and uh, their power structures that have shaped the institutions as they are and invite people to also take part in that. So these three different aspects uh, are important. And what this means in, in practice is that that the uh, educators should be knowledgeable about this kind of philosophy behind mediation. They should also be uh, very knowledgeable, obviously, about the content, whatever it is that they work with. Uh, it's essential to know something about education and kind of on a theoretical level. What does it mean when people learn? Uh, what, what do we think uh, when we talk about knowledge? What, uh, what kind of learning styles there are? Uh, I only mentioned in passing audience research, which is a, an important way of finding out about the audiences and it's a specialist area in itself. Uh, we're, we should be able to think about uh, people in different situations. Uh, this is part of the personal context that we've been talking about. What do people need when they, they come to visit in different uh, combinations or uh, different circumstances? Uh, Questions of accessibility are very important and inclusion. They can be very concrete questions about physical accessibility, but also much more complicated and complex questions about social inclusion or social accessibility and who uh, feels that they are entitled to uh, come and what happens if they don't. And then there are the, the different sort of technical or practical uh, things that uh, are needed that we need to know about how to write uh, uh, how to run workshops, uh, how to organize events. And this actually leads to the uh, last um, part of the, uh, the kind of last slide here where I've also added this kind of generic um, skills uh, in, in the middle of these very specialized skills. So quite often we also we are running projects so we need to be able to uh, manage the finances and human resources. Uh, be specialists about communicating and marketing. Evaluation is important. And also, also building the history of mediation that needs documentation and, and research. So uh, I sometimes think that this is maybe very discouraging for aspiring mediators that this looks huge, but also maybe that, that to think that uh, one person does not need to cover all of this, but ideally there would be a team uh, who has different um, special skills and would be able to cover most of these uh, fields. That's a really uh, important question and, uh, uh, and I'm glad that you remind, reminded me that, uh, yeah, I, would, I should say actually that part of the educator's work within an institution is internal education. <laughs> so you're not only focusing on the people outside uh, the art museum or art institution, but also on the people who are inside. And it's a constant kind of internal education to talk about these issues and, and uh, help people also inside the institution to understand why it is uh, important. There are many arguments that you can use if you need to uh, somehow defend <laughs> this this activity or this position, hopefully not. It's wonderful if not, and there is a you know, feeling of support, but if not, then some of the arguments I think are that it's actually vital for culture uh, and cultural institutions that there is a very wide and common understanding of what we are doing, that there is this understanding in society. If there is no support from the audience, there will be no eventually no funding and no, uh, no um, uh, legitimacy 
for art institutions to exist if there is not this wide understanding in society why art is important why art institutions are important so it's in a way kind of a black male strategy that, that this understanding has to uh, has to be there that it's actually vital for us not not you know it's it's not nothing external it's actually uh, important but of course then it's uh, um it's also a question of sort of kind of civil rights or human rights that everybody uh, has to uh, have an access to culture and we have to think about different ways of how that happens not only access to the culture that we produce but also listening to what is the culture that you are interested in that and that you are producing and widening up that that sort of canon in our head what counts as culture but i don't know maybe this is kind of you know keeping your fingers crossed and, <laughs> and trying to make it understandable why it is this work is really important for the institution itself.